to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, where I want you to go today, and that it can be a blessing to you. Luke chapter 9, and we're on. Uh, Chapter 9, amen. There it is. We're, uh, we've read the scripture this morning, and we're going to give you a few thoughts on what Jesus is doing with his disciples. And that is important for us in the sense that what he's doing, what we hope for us to soon understand, is that as a result, he is taking the gospel to Jerusalem. That's what's going to be happening. So in this study, we're seeing this happen, and we title the message literally, Resolve. For the road. Resolve for the road. And this is part two. We're going to be focusing in on John seeing others do the work of the ministry as well. John seeing others. But it's important for all of us that were gathered back together from last week to this week to kind of get just a touch of how this all happened. And I want you to look and focus a little bit on verse number 43. Verse number 43. They were astonished at the majesty of God. This is when he healed the young man that was with an evil spirit. And the, while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, and he told them that he was going to die on the cross and in verse number 46 is where I want you to see the, the uniqueness of this. In verse 46, it says, and an argument arose among them. A fight about who is to be the greatest. And we spent quite a bit of time last week talking about what that meant. Who was to be the greatest in the kingdom. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side. Now, the day's message is going to be just the opposite of what we saw last week when we preached on who is the greatest, and it's really going to be, and what should be amongst the Christian community, who is the most humblest in a sincere way, in a severe way. C.S. Lewis said, be careful that your humility doesn't turn to pride. And I think that in this day and age, that's not the issue. The issue is trying to remove the pride that's out there. We're surely going to see that on display in the football tonight, right? And all the different aspects of the riches of this world and the entertainment industry and everything that comes into play. Jesus takes the child and says to them in verse 46, this is the greatest among you. And I love that. And then it says in verse 48, receive this child in my name. You receive me. Whoever receives me receives the Father. And for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. God is wanting to establish his kingdom authority, and he's put it in a way that you and I should be able to see and put into our hearts and into our lives those who are great. We said the resolve for the journey of the road is what's happening. He's about to take off and go to Jerusalem. He, it's believed that he's left the Mount of Transfiguration. He is now back in Calpurnium, and they're about to head 90 miles south to Jerusalem. And there the argument starts. And what a start that is. I think of his kids today. Kids get in the car and they'll say either one of two things. They'll either say, he's touching me, or are we there again? No. And that's how you feel sometimes. You wonder, is this 
how we're to start our journey with God. And it's resolved for the road that he wants. It, know this, that when they take off here in Luke chapter 9, and right around verse number 50, his face is set towards Jerusalem. We're going to have, all the way from chapter 9, all the way to chapter 17, this journey. It's going to be a rough journey. It's going to be a long journey for the disciples. And what should have taken two or three days is going to take weeks. And it reminds me of when the Exodus happened. And I want you to remember that when Moses led two million Jews out of Egypt, it was a 17-day journey that took them 40 years. You can either learn God's way, which is the easy way, and get there faster, or you can learn your way and eventually get there, only it's going to be a lot harder and longer. The disciples are going to have 11 chapters of intensity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have to admit that the children of Israel did this because of their sin. 40 years in the wilderness, 17-day journey. The disciples did this because of their sin, only minuscule. It's going to take them weeks and weeks and weeks to get there. It's going to take us 11 chapters to get through it, but I will tell you, there is beauty in the teaching. Can you imagine what it would be like? A little scary. A little scary. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day with the creator of the universe. Twelve men are going to make this journey with them. And it's believed in certain aspects that they go quickly to Jerusalem and then back to, Ju to Galilee for a, a second and then swing back around. Luke doesn't give that. But the synoptic gospels kind of prove that out. When I say synoptic, I mean those that are verse by verse. And I'm really meaning Matthew, Mark, and uh, uh, Luke to a certain degree. But uh, actually at this point it's John. You have the three synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and then John is a thematic gospel. And we know that the theme is of, of love and belief. And he, he skips around the most. So this journey is going to be literally about... I'll tell you exactly how long it is. It's going to be, they're going to leave around September, and they're going to arrive in Jerusalem officially in April. And it normally would have taken them three days. Wow. Jesus, you really must, must want to teach us something. You ever felt that way in your life? That you're taking one step forward and you go three steps backward? And you wonder why the journey of faith is so hard? Well, John and Matthew record a lot that goes on in the final week, but know this, that in the beginning of what happens, it is Luke that gives the details. It's the longest, longest book of the Gospels, and that is important for us to remember and to note that the disciples are going the road of Calvary and the road of, of the crucifixion, and it's going to be hidden from them. And so they're not going to see this, okay? They're not going to grasp what's going on. I want you to just notice how the Jesus is looking at this here. Luke chapter 9, it's really, in, excuse me, this is earlier, it's Luke chapter 7. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Now, that's where his emphasis is going to be. And he's talking about it in a generality for them to see and understand. But get this. That seven days, 24-7 with Jesus, going the better part of seven months, they're going to go through all the things that are basically teaching moments. They've gone through physical aspects of it and just in chapter 9 alone. In chapter 9, here's what's interesting, is that when you see what they've come up with, they started out with 12 being sent out. Look at chapter 9, just the flow of it. All three synoptic gospels mean this, I bring this out. Then secondly, Jesus feeds the 5,000 in all four gospels, including John mentioned this. But that's in chapter 9 as well. Peter then confesses that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And that's in verse number 18. And then the fourth event that happens is that this is the first time Jesus mentions he's going to die on the cross and for the salvation of all mankind. And there we see that Luke leaves out some of the key teachings of the cross and just mentions he will be in the hands of sinful man. Now I want you to notice this. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul. When we get into the latter part of the chapter, I want you guys to note this, that in that aspect, he is showing them the transfiguration. And that he makes this clear to them that he is going to go by way of the cross by because of the law and the prophets. <clears throat> then as they come down from that mount, somewhere up in the northern parts of Israel, there's a little child that's filled with an evil spirit. And the nine disciples could not cast him out. Matthew, Mark, and Luke also mentioned this. They all three do. Jesus has to cast him out and chide them because of little faith. And then the seventh event in this chapter, Jesus talks about again him dying. And in verse number 44, he says, I will be at the hands of sinful men. But it's interesting if you look at verse number 44. It says he will be delivered up. He is being delivered by who? Not the men, but by his father. And it is the father who directs the crucifixion. And it is the father who turns his back on him while he's in the cross. We have the hindsight of looking back. But look at all the events that have just happened in chapter 9. So this long trip is about to happen. And it's going to be long and teaching intensive and not as strong in the area of miracles. There'll be some, but mostly parables and mostly personal time with the disciples. And it's so important for us to, to catch this, okay? John will spend a little bit more time in, in miracles, and he will bring this out to the last week and very long with a number of chapters. Even Luke will have some, but it will be mostly in the areas of the miracles leading up to the uh, crucifixion. This week, we're in verse number 49 to verse 40, verse 56. The resolve for the road and the journey to Jerusalem. That's what he wants us to see. And I want you to notice verse number 48. John answered, Master, we saw, not, not, I'm sorry, not in John 40, 48. I babysitted a grandchild this week. I will tell you something. That's exhausting. I loved every second of it, helping our daughter because she had to work. Her dad, dad had, her husband had to go to school. And I'm going to tell you something. A one and a half year old can wear you out. Mothers, I salute you. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how grandmothers do it. But grandfathers are in a lot of trouble these days. I'll tell you that. I was worn out. It exhausted. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. <clears throat> diapers which I basically facilitated as much as I could on the diaper end of it I want you guys to know that here so my like, pardon for some of the faux pas of going through some of the scriptures here right but I want you to look at verse number 51 when the days drew near for him to be taken up he set his face to go to Jerusalem and he set messengers ahead of them who went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him but the people did not receive him. He's in Samaria, headed south to Jerusalem, because it knows what it says in verse 53. His face was set toward Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? James and John, his disciples, said, they're called the sons of thunder, by the way. And I think they probably meant Thunder and lightning, or lightning first, then the thunder, right? But he said, do you want them to be just burned up? That's what he's saying. That's what they're saying to him. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Resolve for the road and the journey to Jerusalem. How crazy. One moment they're fighting about who's the greatest, and he brings a child for them. The next moment, they're talking about burning up heathen. Or what we would say, people who are half and half. Because that's what Samaritans were. They were despised by the 
the, the, the people of the Jewish times. But catch this here. You can't miss this. Verse 51 says that when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. A beautiful, beautiful passage. This is what he was called to do, and he set his face. And verse 53 reiterates it. When they're in Samaria, we don't know where this village was, but the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. He's coming through, and they reject him, and John and James, his older brother James, said, Lord, uh, we can take care of this problem for you. Just like Elijah did in 2 Kings chapter 1, will call down fire on the Samaritans. Elijah burned up two groups of soldiers, 50 men apiece. The third group, the captain came up to Elijah, he's sitting on the hill, saying the king, the Samaritan king, would like to see you. He's part of that northern tribe, and please don't burn us up. And the Lord said to him, go. So here's John and James saying, we just saw Elijah on the mount a few days ago. I'm just saying, we can do this alone. You want us to do it? And I think it's interesting that they called for permission to do it. Knowing them, they were probably like, oh, do it. They hated the Samaritans. I want you to think about the lowest group you can think of in society. Whether it's the addict, whether it's the harlot, whether it's the molester of children. I'm here to tell you, God wants to enable you and me to show mercy and love to all of them. Because that's how the Samaritans were viewed. And you've got to know that Jesus has already passed through Samaria once. And at the town of Sychar, there was a woman who had many husbands. And the one that she was with right then, she was a Samaritan. And Jesus took the time to show her love and give her salvation. And the whole town, the Bible says, came to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That was in John chapter 4. That was the early part of the ministry. But the disciples, and in particular, John and James were there. Because we know they were there at the baptism and traveled back up to Galilee. But the Bible says that Jesus must needs to go through Samaria. The Temptation of the Jews was always to go around the bad parts of, of the country. <coughs> and we need to see that in our lives. God's calling us to be the ministers to the undesirables, to the deplorables, to those who are the lowest in society. And then why does he do that? I notice it's easy for churches to start out in well-to-do areas. It's not easy for churches to go into areas of poverty in the cities of this country. I'll tell you why. It's because there is no momentum and there is nothing but crime and you're pushed back into defeatism. But God says for us to go. So if it's a man that's living in a trailer that doesn't have power, no one loves him, and he's a foreigner, or if it's a person in the most wealthiest part of town we're to go and we're to show them love and not wish hell on anyone because that's ultimately what John and James were doing weren't they? here's the savior wanting to show them on twice he's told them he's going to be put into the hands of simple men he's going to, going to die in the other gospels he relates that he will be resurrected Luke chooses not to put that in there he says this I want you to think about it. He's at this point in his life, the lowest of the low, and no one was higher than him. We just sang that song, there's nothing greater than him. There's nothing better than him. He is the highest of the high, yet he became the lowest of the low. If we can't make that connection to the people whom we see each and every day who are insignificant, then something is wrong with us. Don't laugh at John and James. Look at yourselves and know that there is pride built within us. Anytime that you look at an individual with disdain, you are looking through the lens of pride because Jesus never does that. 
no matter how they are in their politics, no matter how they are in their immorality, we are to love the unlovable. And because he went so low, we need to see that. We will be exalted one day, but nothing is better than him and nothing is higher than him. I want you to see this scripture up on the screen. Don't take the time to turn there, but this is what I'm talking about. Have the Philippians 2 verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6 now. So important that we see this. It's a familiar passage. Who thought he was in the form, who though he was in the form, he didn't have to think it, of the form of God, meaning he's God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and notice the key part here, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by come, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He did that for all of humanity, to the scum of the scum, to the lowest of low, he became lower. And that's what I want you to see this morning, is that the insignificant in God's eyes are significant. He used the example of the child, and we had a lot of fun with baby videos and pictures of babies and talking about infants and how they are just with needing all the attention in the world, I speak from experiences of the last week now. But I know this, that they're cute and they're cuddly, even when the diapers are stinking. But God looks at the dregs of society and holds them as being the ones that we should count as the most worthy, the most high. I'm going to put it in as practical terms as I can think of. You come here on Tuesday, you come here on Thursday, and is it still Saturday, Sat Susan, on, on Saturday mornings? You come here and you love on people and you see them when you get the chance to see them. And I'm just saying that you can be a blessing to them just by simply a smile as they're here waiting for food. Because I've seen them so many times lined up. And I'm just kind. Many of them can't understand me. I can't understand them. But there's where God, we can't find a more perfect example than the needy that are in our own area. And we need to have that mindset and leave the mindset of the nationalistic thinking that God wants, God, God hates us among us so much. Love those who are unlovable. People are flooding into this country, legal and illegally, and we know this, and I'm telling you, in God's eyes, he wants us to love them. And that's hard preaching. That's personal, isn't it? But it's what God would want. Because I know this. He set his face to Jerusalem. Why? So that he could be humbled. Anytime that you are not in humility, you're in sin. C.S. Lewis also said that the greatest of the sins is pride. And that's the one that we tend to gravitate to the most. Our accomplishments, our background, our country, our lives, our freedom. And we get pride in that, and that's what God wants us to be stripped of. Nothing wrong with loving those things, but don't take count to those things. Don't put stock in those things. Understand this. And I love this because I got this from an old Irish preacher. I wish I could tell you I got it original. Here's where it gets very, very, any time that you get humbled and you're ashamed of something, you're in sin. Humility is to be accepting the shamefulness and be able to be thankful for it. Jesus had his beard plucked. Jesus was spat upon. Jesus was lashed out. A crown of thorns were put on his head. And not one time did he revile. When we think of Jesus putting his face to Jerusalem, I want you to think of the Isaiah 50 passage, which is extremely prophetic. Isaiah 50 in verse number 5. The Lord God has opened my ear. It's a prayer. 
And I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. Now notice verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike. And my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. He was being delivered up. Is what he told the disciples. He was desirous of them. So that he could suffer. He did this willingly. I gave my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and, what's the last word, verse 6? You get ashamed of this? Folks, he was naked on that cross. Yet he felt no shame. He was in, I can't say that for myself, but he was in perfect 100% humility. And he suffered this. Notice verse 7. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Not in God's eyes. Oh he was in the world's wasn't he? Therefore I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. If whatever we get involved with. In helping those who are deplorable. The lowest of the lowest society. Don't be ashamed for it. You have got God's mission, and you have got your mindset set like a flint to take care of it and do it. And understand that you suffer, you're doing that for sacrifice. It doesn't matter. Take it and accept it and follow after it. That is pure humility, and Jesus was going to spend the next seven months teaching those disciples just that. Not just the end of chapter 9. It is the opposite of pride. <clears throat> the greatest sin, Lewis said, was pride. Don't let your humility become your pride. And let take the Gospels and apply it into your lives and love on what are the Samaritans you can find. And go on this journey with them. That's easy for me to preach it. It's a whole other thing to live. It's a whole other thing to live. But can I, as your pastor, set that example and become him? truly humble about this? Isaiah prophesied these things over 500 years ago. And Luke grabs hold of that when he says he set himself up like, like a flint. It's a lot easy for us to love a child. They're precious. They're bound in the life. But can we become a child in our spirit and truly trust on him? Verse 48 says, And he said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is the greatest. That's the greatest of the kingdom. James and John might have been jealous of who was greatest. They wanted to fall, call down fires. But know this. They were full of pride and didn't have any humility. A lot of time it's going to take for these men to become humble. It's going to take it. And they got to spend a lot of time with people wanting to kill them after Jesus leaves. It's not just the Samaritans. The question is, are they going to hate those people who are trying to get rid of them? Should not we be thankful for whatever persecution we receive in this country? And put down our signs and put down our protests and put down our rights. All that stuff is meaningless. It is a hill of dirt. God's calling us to not be ashamed of humility and accepting the most degrading things that we can ever see. We're to be like little kids. I love bath time. I was going to put some pictures in there, and then I thought, well, if somebody sees this and they get it. Glow toys all around. We had ocean blue water. I had never seen a kid have so much fun. He comes out squeaky clean. He's running all around the place. He's having a ball. He's super baby. And then he stops and he pees on my new furniture. 
Because he was naked then. And he was, do you think he cared? Who cared? Who jumped up and he was scolding him? Who got upset with him? A new leather, Corinthian leather furniture. And he's peeing around just having a ball. Because he's one and a half. And he doesn't care. They, it's the best lesson I could ever have in pride. What do I care about some stupid cow cushiony stuff I'd sit on? It doesn't matter. Whatever people will do to you, whatever your family says about you, however you're shunned at work, however many times you have been ridiculed for believing in fairy tales, accept it with grace. And know this, if it gets personal and they strike us or they imprison us, then know this, folks. There's more of a chance for people to come into the kingdom, even though they might be peeing all over the furniture. Y'all hear me? That's what God wants us to do. We've got to remember that we are so full of pride. I'm preaching to me more than I am y'all, and I know this is rough, but it was rough on John and James to hear this from the Lord. Can I get a witness? Jealousy? Pride? Me first, always an attitude. I want y'all to look at that little kid. That's what we're to become like. That's not who we're to a prize. As much as I love my little grandson this week, I've got to say I need to be like that. Because you know what? My stuff stinks too. And it stinks to high heaven. And I need to repent of my pride. And do what's right. When Ronald Reagan was president, he was tasked with the most at this time moving of ambassadors around the world. And our reputation as a country had really been hurt and seemed ineffective. So he asked for a man to be Secretary of State. His name was George Schultz. And he tasked him with getting the best people you could get to represent the United States as ambassadors to other countries. And Schultz was a very wise man. Let me tell you what he did. In the course of interviewing the candidates, and when he especially thought that he was about to recommend to the president, he put this before Congress to be voted on as ambassador, Schultz would reach out from underneath his desk and pull up a globe of the earth. And look at the candidate and say to him, where's your country? Point it out. And the candidate invariably, every time, was thinking it was a test for them to find out where they were going to serve. And they would point to it. And he would look at them and rebuke them very softly and simply say, no, that's not your country. He'd spin the globe around point to the United States and say, that's your country, represent it well to the country you're going to. And I believe the Lord in this passage of chapter 9 is saying the same thing to us. We're not of this world. We come from the kingdom of another country. And God wants us to represent him well in the area of humility. And I believe that with all my heart. When they were saying these things to him, I want to just skip past this here and go to this passage here, Matthew chapter 18. And calling to him a child, same account. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be humble to be saved. You've got to understand what repentance is so that salvation can come. I know that most in here already know that, but notice verse 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Which country do you serve? Do you serve your country, the kingdom of heaven? Or are you trying to serve this world? Our Father, we're thankful for this time. We're thankful for the precious gospel. 
and how that it strips us of our pride. <clears throat> but Lord, so often we go back and we pick up those dead, decaying things that are meaningless, thinking we can help you along with your cause for the kingdom. And Lord, we're so wrong for that. I pray, Father, that we will have the innocence of a child and, Lord, not worry about being ashamed, but may we be humble in true Christian spirit. And may we have the mindset to not care that when we get next to people who oppose us and oppose you, we don't mind getting dirty. We don't mind befriending them. We don't mind loving them. And we don't mind caring for them. Lord, I pray that we will have that mindset, that we would even be willing to die for them so that they might come to you. I pray that, Lord, for the immigrant that's going to probably be kicked out of this country. I pray that, Lord, for the person who has done harm to others in the community. I pray that, Lord, for those in our family who has gone astray from you. And I pray, Father, for that for our neighbor. Help us, Lord, to love the unlovable. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll see you guys next week.